and welcome to Our Town York. I'm Lance Schwartz. Thanks for joining us at the Palmer Museum, located right here in the heart of downtown York. Sit back and relax. We're going to spend the next 30 minutes showing you around the crossroads of America. Our Town York is the midpoint between Lincoln and Grand Island. It's located at the intersection of two major traffic ways, Highway 81 and Interstate 80. 7,802 people call York home. Now here's a little known fact. York wasn't always just York. There was a time back in the late 19th century when there was also a New York. The first homesteaders in York County were Mr. and Mrs. John Anderson. Kent Bedient is the curator of the Palmer Museum. People were going out to California to find gold, and that they were going through here like hundreds, thousands of them, like right along the creek, the south end of York here. And I think that by nature, some people just decided to stay, or they ran out of money. They, or I think there were many reasons how this all happened. York was starting to take shape in the early 1870s. You can see it was a very, very modest little settlement there for quite a few years. Kent says in the 1870s and 1880s, the usage of alcohol divided York into the wet side of town and the dry side of town. If you wanted to drink, you had to go to New York, which was the section of the town north of the railroad tracks. And um, the, the, the rest of the town voted to be dry. There was a very, very, very active and, for, and forceful uh, temperance movement to keep York dry. That situation didn't last long. For a while, anyway, New York had some saloons, but it then was eventually incorporated back. It became one town then eventually. I think they were interested in founding uh, you know, an upright community. Kent notes yet another interesting tidbit about our town York. Buddy Holly's girlfriend, Echo McGuire, attended York College in 1957, just two years before Buddy tragically died in a plane crash. Over the past 16 years, York has become widely known for their brightly colored water tower landmark that's located along Interstate 80. I don't think anybody had any idea that it would become such an icon, which it has. We've had suggestions of putting a revolving restaurant on the top of it. Bob Sauter with the York County Visitors Bureau says this water tower has become synonymous with our town York. It looks nice, it's attractive, but people remember it. There are very few other water towers around that are painted in a manner that people really remember them. This iconic symbol of York is splattered all around Bob's office. The water tower balloon image we use on everything. I'm a little shameless because I'll use it on just about anything that I certainly can. And he's not kidding. Anything from our giveaway bags, we use it on our rack cards, our postcards, my business card, magnets, tabs. From Christmas tree ornaments to lapel pins, you name it, Bob has put a York balloon on it. That goes back to about 1998. After the water tower was built 15 years ago, the original plan was to paint the new south tower the same beige and blue as the North Tower had been painted. But some citizens wanted to see a design with a little pizzazz that would make York memorable to motorists. Personally, Bob is glad the hot air balloon theme only went so far. Originally, they talked about painting a basket with people, which I'm glad they didn't do. The I-80 exchange is not only the home of the iconic water tower, it's also where the Avenue of Flags begins in the summer. I'm the flag guy, the flag man. And I'm guessing no one loves the Stars and Stripes more than Bruce Wagner. I never get tired of, you know, handling flags. Sometimes I, when I'm driving the Avenue of Flags, I think, wow, I touched every one of those flags. And to this former military man, that means a lot. Those flags represent the great veterans of our nation, the women and men that have served and lost their lives. 
Probably at least half of these are going to have to be totally replaced. Mom can probably sew up some of them. Bruce and his brother Matt take a lot of pride in this patriotic project. This one was probably out on the highway. It's so rewarding. Um, a lot of hard work goes into it, but when you have those people that that come to you and they find you when the flags first go up and say, they say, I've been waiting for it all year. That's what really makes it worthwhile to know that people truly appreciate it. Each summer from Memorial Day to Veterans Day, nearly 400 flags fly simultaneously on the south side of York. And over the years, Bruce has perfected the process. We went with a, a heavier duty unfurler and we drill our own holes and you know cut our own lengths. These flags are going to last approximately seven months before they're either too faded or too torn. Many of them each year will be brand new. Which takes anywhere from six to $8,000 a year to keep this project uh, flying. And over the past 16 years, Bruce has relied on the generously patriotic people of our town, York. You know, we got bankers, refrigeration, you know, people, just teachers, all walks of life just step up to make this project possible. Matt is proud of his big brother for not only coming up with the idea, but also persevering through some challenging times. Bruce was willing to take it on and he continues to see his dream go up and come down every year through the summer. I wanted to say that York is made up of good people that love this nation. I want people to realize we are the patriotic heart of America. Make sure and take a trip down the Avenue of Flags beginning on Memorial Day and running through Veterans Day. Lee Batterton has been collecting marbles for over a half century, and they're all on display at one of just two marble museums in the United States. I uh, play marbles every day. Marveling at marbles consume most of Lee Batterton's young life. Three or four times a day, before school, recess, noon after school I love play marbles that's why it's no wonder that Lee is today the proud owner of this million dollar collection to start with there's about 1350 jars around the top of the two rooms Lee has been seriously collecting marbles for more than a half century well in this row here these are all paper mache marbles. That one in the back is the largest one in the world. Even at 80 years of age, Lee is still mesmerized by marbles. Oh yeah, I love going to marble shows. We go to six or seven a year. These marbles down here on this board here are all marbles made from uh, glass scrapings off of a uh, furnace. Some of Lee's most prized marbles were made by Christensen in the 1920s. They only lasted about three years, so they're real rare and hard to find. Both sought after marble there is. This is the largest one that ever was made. They only made three that size. I got two of them. That's worth a bunch. It's probably worth about 25000 Some of Lee's marbles are made of uranium. And when you get uranium in a glass, they glow. Yeah, there's uranium in them marbles. The black light's what brings it out. After 54 years of collecting, Lee has recently reached the million marble mark. And if you don't believe him, he invites you to come on out and count them for yourself. One. Somebody got on the computer and figured it up and take 11 days without eating or stopping or drinking to count them all. <laughs> okay, I'll take your word for it. At least I know that if I ever officially lose my marbles, I'll know where to find them. Lee's legendary Marble Museum is open seven days a week from 10 to 6, and the admission is free. Straight ahead, York entertains at the Yorkshire Playhouse, and they prepare to entertain at the new Holtis Convention Center. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Our Town York and the Palmer Museum. 
The Yorkshire Playhouse is currently finishing up their 40th year of producing quality plays and musicals in our town, York. He was a famous trumpet man from old Chicago way. He had a voice sound that no one else could play. After 30 years of performing at a variety of venues around York, the Yorkshire Playhouse raised $300,000 10 years ago and renovated the old Hestead's department store into a theater that seats 130 people. Todd Kirschenbaum is a Playhouse director. It's a great venue. We have members from 40 different communities around Nebraska that actually belong to us and come to our shows. So it, it's, uh, it's, and that's the reputation of 40 years of productions of, of great talent. And it's, uh, it's very exciting. This is the only Mr. Brown. The Yorkshire Playhouse produces four main shows a year, and they average more than 4,000 patrons annually. Kelly Widger is a performer and supermarket manager who feels that the Playhouse productions are often the talk of the town. Working in the public that I do, um, I, I'm always having people come up to me, oh, well, what, what's the next show? Are you in the next show? What's it going to be? When is it? And so there's always, there is that energy from the public that, that they're interested in the next show and what we're doing. Choo -choo, choo -choo, choo -choo, woo -woo. The performers are inspired by York native Fred Niblo, who has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He was at one time one of the highest sought after uh, silent screen directors uh, in, in Hollywood. He directed uh, Greta Garbo, Rudolph Valentino, he did the original Ben-Hur, and uh, he was very highly sought after. And the, cool, the real cool thing that I love is that he is one of the five founding members of the Academy of Motion Pictures, the, the home of the Oscars. The first production of the 2014 season is a Neil Simon comedy called Fools. That production will open up in mid-February. The York Chamber of Commerce says it is virtually unheard of for a private group to build a brand new $8 million building and then give it to a city. But that is precisely what's happening at the crossroads of Interstate 80 and Highway 81. What I like is, is the plank ceiling. I think that's really looking good. Kelly Holtis spearheaded the Convention Center project. It really is a lot larger than I expected. The president of the Cornerstone Bank was interested in building a building that would catch people's attention as they entered York from Interstate 80. Well, the thing we wanted from the beginning that when someone would drive in from Highway 81, that they'd really, really see the building at its best, and that'd be the wow effect we're looking for. What we've got is Two large median rooms on both the ends, and both of those median rooms can be split into two. They Drew also Jensen a is a hometown contractor who envisions the big things um, for this 40,000 square foot facility. Well, I don't know. We're hoping maybe we get some concerts and maybe we get some big events. I'm sure we're going to have a number of weddings in here um, and a number of, I think we could use the whole facility as a large convention center. Since 1940, the city auditorium has hosted most of the large events around our town, York. Kelly thinks it's time for an alternative. When we announced this a year ago in September, we had no idea what the reception would be. It's been tremendous. We've raised a, a lot of money. This is an $8.2 million project, and we've raised $7.2 million already. So we have another million to raise. So if anyone wants to send in donations, we still are accepting donations. The York Chamber of Commerce is planning on the convention center opening in September, and that's important because there are already quite a few events scheduled for October, November, and December of 2014. Dave Wessels was a York bachelor who passed away in 1993, and in his handwritten one-line will, he left his entire estate to create Wessels Living History Farm. Hello, and welcome to Wessels Living History Farm, a 1920s prosperous family farm. And the farm's director, Dale Clark, says this place is unique. Because most museums end in 1900, we start in the 1920s. And we depict farm life in the 20s and the early 30s. And once inside the beautifully restored house, it's easy to believe you've traveled back in time to December of 1925. It's a wood-burning stove. Caroline Goodrow and is a historian. 1920s was the first time they actually got things. They went out and they bought gadgets. They bought um, just different items that they couldn't buy before. They couldn't afford them. The house was moved to this location just south of the interstate in 2002 
and Dale opened up the farm to the public in 2005. We were recognized as the leading new museum by the State Department of Tourism a couple years ago. And Nebraska Heritage recognized Wessels last year as the top heritage stop in the state. We have had visitors from all 50 states and 36 foreign countries now. Dale feels that the education that can be found on this farm is becoming more and more valuable. Even Nebraska people do not recognize the importance of agriculture and how rapidly agriculture is changing. We find kids that can't tell you the difference between lettuce and cabbage. They don't realize where the food comes from that's on their table. Wessels offers a complete range of educational classes, from preschool to graduate. And they just so happen to throw in some of the most gorgeous sunsets you've ever seen at no additional charge. You can celebrate Christmas at Wessels Living History Farm from now until December 27th. Coming up, it's time to explore a pair of educational institutions that have been making our town York very proud as of late. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Our Town York. I'm Lance Schwartz. York College was formed way back in 1890, and now, on the verge of their 125th anniversary, the Panthers are still on the prowl. What makes York College special is the people. Matthew Madol loved York College as a student. Now he's busy making York College great for the players on his women's basketball team. The one thing I really try to get across to kids is that this place is going to help you prepare for life. Uh, if our job is to only win basketball games or only win track meets or wrestling meets, we're not doing our job. We're giving the kids the foundation they need to go on into life, to be successful, be a great husband, be a great wife, be a great employee, run their own business. We want our kids to be successful beyond anything athletic-wise. I picked York College just because of the spiritual influence here. Alyssa Becker is one of Coach Madol's basketball players. Honestly, my spirituality has grown a lot since I've been here. Um, I was a Christian before, but here on campus you have so many, so many choices of things to be involved in that can help you grow. And one of those things is chapel. It's held every weekday morning in the Student Activity Center, and it's attended by each of the nearly 500 students on campus, as it has been for decades. Everybody gets together in chapel, and we usually like, get to hang out for a second, and it's good to see everybody every day, and so it's awesome. Dylan Brewer is a senior basketball player that has enjoyed the family feeling he gets on the York College campus. I mean, everybody's just really open to talk to you whenever you need a pro whenever you have a problem, and like, whenever you need like a favor or something, people are just jumping at the chance to help you out at any time. York College started out affiliated with the United Brethren Church, and it remained that way until 1956, when control was transferred to the Churches of Christ. Spirituality is what makes this place tick. Just like at York College, there is an overwhelmingly positive vibe these days at York High School. And it's all thanks to the mentality movement. Well, there's not much that's not going good for us right now. Adrian Goki has her finger on the pulse of York Duke Nation. We're doing pretty good athletically and in our fine arts, like mock trial, one act. And Jonah Odie says a lot of that success can be attributed to a new focus that was initiated three years ago. When I came in my freshman year, they started a thing called the mentality movement, and that just really turned things around here at York. Uh, the mentality here is completely different than what it was in years past, and really positive and a lot of support in all areas. Jonah says that positive vibe has been contagious. We just tried to change the mentality to a, a positive mentality, get everyone supporting each other and looking towards the future to get programs back on their feet. Principal Mitch Bartholomew says Our Town York has backed the high school 100 uh, percent. School is as good as its, as its community. And I really think this, this is a fantastic community. Uh, my wife and son and I love it here. Uh, we have very supportive people, you know, uh, people that care about each other. Duke Power has gotten even stronger this year with a $12.5 million renovation and gymnasium addition. 
our kids have seen this and they love it you know they they're, they're taking a lot more pride in keeping care of the building you know ever since uh, the construction crews have come through you know mm -hmm. everything that I hear from them is you know the decisions that we made uh, are fantastic still ahead our final story of the show awaits and there's not another one in the world quite life four winds Indian books Welcome back to Our Town York. What is the best kept secret in the state of Nebraska? Well, it just might be that Our Town York is home to the largest collection of Native American Indian books in the world. Oh, and people have never been in here. Uh, they'll come in and they'll go, oh, oh. <laughs> Over 2,000 titles of Native American books are kept in stock. I think the Native American children's books are exceptionally illustrated. Lois Klingsborn is the owner of Four Winds Indian Books. This book was one of a series from Smithsonian of four books written by Native Americans. And this one is particularly interesting because it was written before the Twin Towers came down. Lois spent many years reading to grade schoolers. Every night when the stars came out, Coyote waited until the beautiful star came near the observation deck. Lois's dad worked as an Indian missionary. Well, my dad started in 86 when he was 80 for a little something to do when he retired. And by 92, it was more than he wanted to do because he'd have found a niche that nobody was in. Lois took over Four Winds in 1993. And since her main clients are mainly schools and libraries throughout the United States and Canada, many educational books for teachers of Indian children are offered. Although the store is primarily a mail order business, the doors are always open to anyone lucky enough to discover this jewel in downtown York. It's been fun. Well, that'll do it for our memorable journey around our town York. For everyone at 1011 News, I'm Lance Schwartz. So long, everybody.